comment period. We have a number of folks to the public. Adele. Five comment. Okay. My name is Adele Franks, and I attended the um, Board of Building Regulations and Standards hearing. Uh, our action is a public listening session in Boston on Tuesday, and it was an extremely educational experience. And I thought I would tell you a little bit about it because it's related to the topic that you, that's on your agenda, which is a net zero stretch code. There were about 50 of us who were there to be listened to um, who wanted to speak about the need for a net zero stretch code to replace the current stretch code, which isn't much of a stretch anymore. And um, uh, we were dismayed to find out that we were actually at the end of the meeting, that the public comment was at the end of the meeting, not at the beginning, but we had, so we sat through the meeting. Uh, but uh, Senator Joe Comfort came and they did take her out of order. And she spoke about her bill, which would require the BBRS to um, create a net zero stretch code. And she was very diplomatic. And she said that um, she'd much prefer to work with them rather than legislate um, this thing. Um, and you know, etc. And they um, they responded somewhat defensively and said um, she said there were communities that were approaching her asking for this. They said they need that in order to meet their climate goals, and um, they were somewhat angry about that. And they said, "What do you mean? Yeah. Um, anyone can build a net zero building in this state. There's nothing in the building code to prevent that." They're just like, well, that wasn't quite the point, but. Um, they were pretty vociferous about that point. And um, she handled it very well. And then she left. And then uh, Representative Gouveia came, who was the House sponsor of the same bill, and essentially said the same things. And it also offered to work with them instead of legislating to them. And, um, you know, they were, they, they said some of the very same things. And uh, they also said, you know, um, we don't understand why you're saying that music asking for this because no one's come, none municipalities have come to us and asked for this. And in fact, if this were really a problem, they would have because, you know, we can make exceptions to the building code. So that was, that was intriguing. And for the whole rest of the session, they kept repeating those two points over and over again. The building code doesn't limit anybody from building net zero and nobody's come to us to complain about this. So anyway, we sat through some um, appeals there were five appeals to the recent approvals that they gave to the amendments to the IECC. And um, three of those were related to wanting to weaken the energy efficiency standards um, that had been approved through this very long process that was in addition to the IECC. It was quite fascinating. But anyway, we finally got to the public comment period. and. Um, since they had been complaining about how municipalities have contacted them, and we asked, well, well, there are some municipal officials in the audience. Would you like to hear them first? But no, they didn't want to go out of order. <laughs> there, were, there were municipal officials from Boston, Cambridge, Somerville, and Wellesley. Um, in any case, there were a lot of, a lot of people giving testimony. The board was, um, I would say, rude to most of the people. And um, was, they were looking at their watches and saying, well, you know, you cut it short, cut it short. We don't have much time left. Um, but a lot of very good points were made. And um, finally, um, a, there was a lawyer who got up and said that, that he was he'd been previously a state prosecutor. And he wanted to read them the statute. Or I don't know if it was a regulation or a statute under which they actually operate, which says that municipalities cannot adopt their own code, they have to use the state code, and if a municipality wants an exception, they can appeal to the BBRS, and the BBRS could make an exception if they found that there was a very specific local situation that required that. And then he pointed out that um, climate change was actually a global problem, and uh, that wouldn't really be grounds to uh, uh, grant an exception to the building code for a municipality that, that wanted a stricter um, stretch code than the state code. And they thought that was very interesting and they thanked him. And uh, near the end of the uh, proceedings, there was uh, one member on the board who said, you know, we could form a, a subcommittee to examine this issue. And, uh, and the uh, chair of the board said, 
no, we've lost five staff members. There's no way we can do that. We need more staff. And she then said, you know, there's enough experts in this room that I bet we could get some help from them and we probably don't need any more staff. So that's, that's pretty much where it ended. And um, the reason I'm bringing it up um, is to give you the flavor of this is because I don't think there's any way that the BBRS on its own is going to uh, create a uh, net zero stretch code. This is going to require a lot of pressure from municipalities. And so I'm hoping that you all uh, will be part of that solution to put more pressure on them and whoever supervises them um, to encourage them to work with the legislators to uh, create a, a net zero stretch code. And, um, and also to perhaps through the city council to um, encourage the city council to adopt a resolution that supports the proposed legislation that Joe Comerford and Tammy Gouveia have introduced in the legislature that would require them to create a net zero stretch code. Thank you. Um, first, I want to say thank you for going and giving us a great report. It's really important. And uh, thanks for making the trip out there for doing that. Do you know um, what the time frame is in this legislation? What are they looking at? It's a two year session. They're in no hurry to get anything done, so they usually wait until the very last minute to, to uh, if they're going to vote on something. Most things never, of course, come up for a vote. So I don't know where this one would be in that. So we're looking Which, at the, uh, based on the ICC 2021 code, right. not the 18, which is right. already coming in January. Exactly. Well, I, I, that's a good question. The um, yeah, the IACC code, I believe, is you know for, for 2019, based on 2018 ICC, mm -hmm. has been adopted. I believe you're right. It starts in January, okay. but that's still that's not the stretch code. That's the stretch code right. could, be, could be addressed and looked at at any time. I don't think that there's a time frame around that. I mean, that, I don't think that is attached to the three-year IACC update. The stretch code is is a separate thing. It might just be a practicality when, when the code changes on the stretch code. Yeah, but they didn't change the stretch code when they changed the code. Right. So, um, and I don't think they did last time either. I think the stretch code is kind of a separate mm -hmm. thing. But I'm not positive of the time frame. I don't know if there is a, a limited time to get change now um, before they kind of basically set it aside and say we're not going to touch this until 2021. Right. Um, but, but I don't think it's totally bad for it. I don't think we should assume that it got to wait until 2020. No, I think it's important to step up to it. I mean, yeah. that's kind of my point. It's like if this is a three-year target, then in between now and then, the stretch code should step up to it, whether right. it's 10% right. better than current or something. Right. 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 Well, nothing's going to happen without a lot of pushing. Mm -hmm. And perhaps the Massachusetts Municipal Association is another avenue to put pressure on this board. <coughs> I know uh, I spoke to Darren at NEAP, and he was, uh, they're also working on this. Uh, there was someone from me there. Yeah. Okay, um, other comments from the public? Lily. Hey, everybody. Lily Lombard. Um, thank you, Adele, as always, for bringing incredible intelligence and um, providing advocacy on really important issues around energy and sustainability. I feel like that's one of the things that makes this city work, are people like Adele who step up and, and fill in for us where we can't be in many places. So um, I, I'm coming here because I know that you have on your agenda, at least I believe you have, the topic of the latest draft ordinance. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Okay. Large scale, you mean the commercial? Yes, scale. regarding the large scale ground mounted solar yeah. arrays. And I wanted to make myself available to answer any questions. Carolyn, Mish, and I uh, worked on this together probably over three very intensive Times and then I, I probably did 40 additional hours of research and investigation into this, talking to about 15 different people, um, anywhere from communities that have already adopted <coughs> bylaws to the Pioneer Valley Planning Commission to both my representatives um, and uh, a lot of uh, researchers, a lot of people who are studying the impact of um, solar arrays on the conversion of forests. So um, I support, at least is, is I last saw it, I support the draft that is in front of you, and I'd be happy to answer any questions if you have any when, when it comes up on your agenda. Great. 
anybody else? Okay. Um, uh, towards that end, then I think um, I think it makes sense to actually move the uh, the what Lily was just talking about uh, top on the agenda, so that you, know, okay. you guys can <laughs> get out of here if you if you, if you need to. So so the reason it's on the agenda um, was because the last time we met. Uh, um, Alisa Klein and, and Bill had indicated that they could use some more input from, because yeah, at that point there was a, we didn't have everybody on the same page, and they were looking for some, some input um, from, from me in particular, and so it was really on the agenda for me to report back. Um, I don't have a copy of the, uh, of the ordinance, um, uh, I don't think the counselors, I, mean, I don't think the uh, commissioners here have seen one. Um, we got word that you two were in agreement, or I got word that you two were in agreement. Um, uh, I did a little research on myself, um, uh, not a lot. Um, I can say I did a little research on uh, kind of back of the envelope exploration on just how fast would a PV array um, uh, offset carbon emissions that have been lost through cutting the forest and lost through a forest not growing subsequently. So I've got some information on that if anybody wants, but quite frankly, if you guys have come to an agreement, I think we're gonna make this a very short agenda. Because um, the, the Energy Commission wasn't really involved in the conversation because the Tree Commission was doing such a good job. We didn't feel we had to be until the last minute uh, call last time. And, um, and we don't have a lot to, to uh, add. So it may be, you just basically finished our agenda. <laughs> <laughs> if um, I may. Yes, do, absolutely. Do I want to go to the commission though, please. The, the council, as much information as we can get relative to this is going to help at least um, make the debate more informed, which is okay. kind of important. I mean, you know, we, we frequently as councilors futz around not knowing what we're doing. And making law is kind of a critical thing to do out of the zone. So, so, I mean, I'd love to hear the information you have. Uh, Carolyn, you, are you prepared to present what the changes were in, in brief sure. thumbnail sketch? Yeah. yeah. And just so I know what we're facing. And, I mean, having signed off from the tree committee is great. Having, having, having uh, agreement between the agencies is excellent. But then at the same time, I think it's important that at least someone have a passing notion about what the hell is going on. <laughs> Carolyn, you want to go first? <laughs> sure. Um, just briefly, background. Um, the reason, I don't know if you all had talked about the reason why we're looking at the changes to large scale um, solar installations. Have you we, discussed it at all? Yes, we did. We did okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so we're trying to, um, two things. One, sort of close a loophole um, in the ordinance uh, relative to the ability for um, developers to do massive amounts of clear cutting, but also try to allow um, some development um, in forested areas that were previously prohibited. So we know we've had interest from solar developers to um, in areas of the city where there are large stands of forest, and they were coming up against that cap. Um, so our, um, the changes that um, were um, a little bit concerning to the um, Public Shade Tree Committee, our commission was um, related to um, one, when the threshold, what threshold would trigger these additional review criteria, and then also what level of review. Is it, is it a site plan review or is it special permit? Special permit is a little bit um, a higher hurdle to overcome in front of the planning board. So um, the um, City Council Legislative Matters Committee sent it back for more massaging um, between basically um, planning board and, and the Tree Commission. And in that context, um, uh, Lilia and I sat down and looked at um, some uh, um, ways that she felt like the Tree Commission could be comfortable with um, the standard. So, the changes um, lower the threshold for planning board review down from originally, originally it was introduced at, at five acres, 
um, would trigger planning board review um, for applicants to meet um, a series of, of um, performance or environmental analysis and um, present that to the planning board. Then um, it seemed reasonable to make that drop that down to three acres based on um, one of the projects that um, has already gotten approval from the planning board that um, was comparable to the current threshold. Um, this latest version drops it down to a two acre threshold. So if someone is proposing, if a developer is proposing two acres or more of tree clearing, then that would trigger an analysis um, of ecological impacts as well as carbon offsets and an evaluation of how much, um, you know, what the benefit is, weighing the benefit of solar versus the loss of um, the carbon se sequestration in that forest. So it's, um, the idea is to create, um, not just look at the carbon um, balance between um, solar and what the trees um, are storing and what solar is saving, but also look at the whole forested canopy and the, um, the ecosystem in that area. And particularly um, the um, restricted, restrictive around areas where there's um, special habitat and um, uh, wetlands and burrow pools and that kind of um, um, characteristic. The one other added element is to have um, to use um, information that the um, Nature Conservancy has um, pulled together from scientific data about resilient forests and landscapes, and they've mapped a whole region of um, not just the, e the East Coast, but it's sort of a broader area going almost into the Midwest about where there's some important corridors for um, climate resiliency. So. We use that data now actually um, in supporting our applications for um, when we apply for grants for open space. So it's not, so it, it's, um, it's um, a known body of research that's been done and that we've already used previously, but we're, we would incorporate that into this analysis so the applicants would have to show that they're not within these um, really important um, climate um, resiliency zones, essentially. Um, so that's an added level of analysis um, that the planning board would evaluate as part of any application that comes before the board. Um, the solicitor has had an opportunity to look at some modifications. Yes, but I have not heard back. But I'm ho I mean, obviously, before it goes to legislative matters, I want to make sure that um, the solicitor is on board. Um, I sent it to him last week. Um, it's structurally the same. So. It's structurally the same. The one change is that we had through this um, modification at, at one stage we had taken everything out of special permit because right. he was concerned about the um, well um, he he was supportive of taking putting it in site plan so it's clear that no matter what you get a permit. Um, I think think that on the face of it though, if you still have to do the analysis you know, under site plan versus special permit effectively, it's the same, but um, we put it back into special permit just um, as an additional level of ability for the planning board to say no with, you know, with um, justification based on the zoning. Okay, so we'll, we'll see. That we'll find out what that matters. Right. So essentially, the threshold's been changed, the trigger threshold down from three to two. Um, and <clears throat> further, for, further criteria of, of analysis. Right. There are a couple of questions that maybe we can answer in your conversations with other people going through this. Um, why was it changed from three to two? And second, what has the feedback been from developers? Is this seen as now a major? hindrance to cost-effective development, or are they like, whatever, you know, it's, it's all part of it, we're so used to this kind of stuff, it's going to be financial viable anyways. Um, what's, what's been kind of the reaction? Um, well, so the reason, it, we'll start with the, the rationale behind the three to two acres. So we've had two projects that required tree clearing. Um, one project hit, 
the original cap was 25,000 board feet, no matter what, you couldn't get a special permit beyond that. So if you cut more than 25,000 board feet, or if that was your plan, um, you were dead in the water, essentially. You couldn't even come forward for a project. Um, one project that the planning board approved um, required two acres of clearing, and they were just at about 24,900 board feet. The other project was closer to three acres. So originally, or, or um, partway through this, um, three acres was selected because it was the bigger number between those two projects that we had. Mm -hmm. um, um, Lily expressed some concerns that maybe three acres was too much before it kicked in all these new standards for analysis. So um, I think we can justify two acres because we've actually had a project that um, was um, right around two acres of, of clearing. So um, that was just at that original threshold of 25,000 board feet. Um, we have not shopped this around to solar developers to get their reactions. We've talked to, I've talked to one solar developer that wants to do a project in Leeds um, and described generally that they would have to do an environmental analysis of the um, area that they were intending to cut and the only reaction I got was they went back and looked at the parcel and saw that where they had initially plopped down their plan for panels was across an area where there were ver vernal pools and wetlands so when we looked at that together I said you know it doesn't make sense to be on this slope <laughs> with that and they were able to um, look at another portion of the property. So for them, the property was so big, they could really adjust. In terms of the other detailed criteria, um, there hasn't really been, um, I, it hasn't been um, widely broadcast enough, I think, for people, developers, to sort of understand that. There's one aspect of the ordinance that I think um, may be um, difficult to comply with, and that is that Right now, there's a standard that says you have to keep the stumps in place because once you remove the stumps, obviously you're releasing carbon. So I think that might be a difficult hurdle. Above two acres. What's above, that? Above two acres. Right, above two acres. So you know, for access, you could clear stumps to get your trucks in there and and, um, yeah, and, and to install to, the infrastructure. Yeah. Yeah. So someone had to. You know, drill piling. Yeah. There's a truck stump in the way. They to can take remove the stump it for out, that. Right? Because they're allowed to do that, right? Correct. Well, um, if you, it, I mean, the way that it's written, it says up to two acres of stump removal. Right. So, you know, we would hope that they'd be able to find, um, you know, select where they need to put those posts and then add that up and um, hopefully it's less than two acres. I, yeah, I suspect, yeah, it doesn't sound like. I mean, you, you stick the post in, and they're probably going to miss most stumps. And every once in a while, hit a stump, and you got to take that stump out. It strikes me. It's, you know, it doesn't strike me as, it doesn't sound onerous. Okay. As long as you don't have to leave every stump in, you know? Yeah. If you get to take some stumps out so you can put your infrastructure in. Yeah. But I'm not an expert on it, but that, that's the way it strikes me. Yeah. Yeah. Really? I, I want to get back to Aiden's question by giving a, a 30,000 foot view on the situation, and that is, so the Audubon commissioned some geography professors at Clark University to study the Im land impact of uh, large-scale ground-mounted solar array, and they found that forest conversion was the most common land siting, uh, you know, formally cut forest is the most common land siting for large-scale solar, for commercial solar. Formally cut. Formally cut, like cut it and, and install the solar array system. Um, and the state, incentivizes that because their subtractors for cutting forests are so nominal that the profit is still so great and land is so cheap. The forested land is the cheapest land in, in Massachusetts and of course Western Mass forested land is the cheapest of the cheapest land. So um, the impact in our region is, is tremendous. So this study that they did was from 20, 2001 to 2015. They found that 3,300 acres had been cleared for, um, for siting solar. And what we know is from 2015 to today, it's really ramped up. Um, so we don't have those numbers yet, but 
what I have is a whole lot of anecdotal stories from communities around Western Mass that are freaking out because they are sometimes very small communities with only volunteer comms, comms or um, planning boards and they have not equipped themselves with the um, local regulation to manage um, these um, large companies coming in, buying the land cheaply, and then you know, applying for permitting. So, um, so we really are seeing some dramatic impact in Western Massachusetts, and that's you know, what we are in some ways addressing. And if it means that they come to us and go, wow, um, you know, there's a hurdle here. I'm gonna, I'm gonna take my, you know, my project to the next town over. That's unfortunate for other towns. It protects Northampton. But what I've been doing, and, and I've partnered with some other um, people working on this. One woman in particular who lives in Northampton, who works for the Appalachian Mountain Club, is we're we're starting to equip other communities with the tools that they can quickly adopt to to also um, better manage these. Um, I just want to give you an example of the sort of companies we're, we're, we're dealing with. So in the town of Blandford, which is in the southwestern corner of the state, it's like got a population of under 2,000. They have only volunteers in their municipal government. Um, they, ha they have um, four applications um, under review now of 30, you know, 30 acre and greater um, solar arrays that would involve forest cutting of, of that scale. Um, that the, the company that has established itself there um, calls itself Blanford Sun, but it's really owned by a $90 billion um, energy company called Next Era Energy that is completely agnostic. It peddles in pipelines, nuclear, um, solar, wind, anything that, that makes them money. Um, and really, they are completely disinterested in the impact it'll have on the local community. So it really is up to us. Um, this is this, what we're dealing with is a failure of the state to um, to manage the market incentives for this, and they are under review. They're coming up for like their 400 megawatt review. Um, but in the meantime, this is what municipalities have to do to to manage, um, you know, a, a really dramatic uh, impact on their landscape. So yeah. I, yeah, I'd I'd like to in, introduce a, 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 a well. First of all, let me say that I, I fully support saving trees and not cutting them down for solar. I think that it's somewhat idiotic. Um, there should, what however, I'm Gordon Meadows. I work for a company called CTI Energy Services. Okay. We're an energy service company out of uh, Amherst. Uh, I grew up in Amherst. Live here. I've lived here for eight years. Um, so I, I am completely in support of not cutting down trees. I would caution you against characterizing those large companies that are developing the solar as, as being kind of like evil corporations that are looking for money. Um, what, they're, what they're in the process of doing is diversifying their energy portfolio and making a significant effort to move over to using renewable sources for power. Uh, and those companies that do currently control the energy system uh, really should be looked at as potential allies in this fight. I do think that uh, they all see where things are going and moving over towards renewables uh, coupled with power, uh, coupled with grid scale energy storage and anything that the towns can do to work with those companies in figuring out what the solutions could be would be greatly to their benefit. Uh, I really do, don't think that cutting down trees is the answer, but there needs to be some way to produce enough energy to replace fossil fuels and sometimes that's going to involve cutting down trees and that that calculation should be really and truly understood with the carbon offset of, of losing that carbon capture capacity um, and, and then that, that decision should be made uh, as a team effort to, to make sure that the best solution is being put in place uh, for the environment and this transition to clean energy. Um, so th those companies if approached correctly, could become allies and could probably help with the, pro the problem. 
So I want to, just for, for time wise, I want to jump in here, but I just want to, because I don't think it's been brought out, Carolyn, and you can confirm this, but my re I saw a draft of the ordinance, and it looked to me like what it was doing was, if, if the, you get hit, you have to look at this analysis. The analysis includes a carbon balance, basically a carbon study. You have to determine, you know, is your, is this going to produce, over a 10-year period, um, are you going to add more carbon to the air, or are you going to take more carbon out? Um, and that's part of the piece, right? That's part of the ordinance, which is just what you, Gordon, what you just say. You know, it needs to be based on an actual study. What, you know, is this going to be helpful, or is this not going to be helpful? And then on top of that, you know, the thing that I couldn't respond to when I was asked is all the forestry management, all of the wet, you know, the benefits of, you know, that's not, I'm not a forester, that's not my, and it sounds like that's all worked into the ordinance as well. Mm -hmm. You know, just you know, all that extra, that's, that's above and beyond the carbon bit. Yeah. So, Bill, if you want to know real briefly, what I did was I took kind of a back of the envelope uh, analysis, I took our landfill um, array, and I said, okay, there was a bit of the landfill array that was built on a field. Uh, so it's fairly densely packed, and I said, what if that had been forested? And I took one acre of that, just for example, and I said, how much carbon offset would that one acre of this land, of this particular array, how much would it offset? And I use Amoresco's um, minimal values. They're guaranteed output values. In other words, it's never going to get this low. We're going to have a higher output than this. So, I looked at how much would it, how much using the DOER's um, uh, emissions factors, I, I looked at how much would this offset. I then went online and just looked around for uh, data on how much carbon is stored in Massachusetts forests and how much carbon do Massachusetts forests absorb on an annual basis. And I was surprised, I actually found, I was actually surprised how readily I found information, including stuff like um, a 50 year old oak forest. Um, and as for those, so that carbon held in and the carbon being absorbed, um, I used uh, uh, the maximum amount. Um, so I gave the forest the benefit of the doubt. I gave it the maximum amount. And then I did a year by year analysis and said, um, you know, how long will it take before the PV array actually offsets more carbon than we're losing through the initial cuts and we're losing through the um, absorption of carbon over the years. And in that case, I came up with five years. The PV array would actually, um, if we had, if we had, if it had been a forest there, and we had cut that forest, um, uh, in this anecdotal um, uh, instance right now, uh, you know, in five years, the PV array would start to offset more carbon than the forest would have captured. Caveats: Not every um, PV array system is going to be this nice densely packed array that's on our, on our, on our field. You know, we might have one that's kind of more spread out. So your PV array is not going to be a, a offsetting as much. Um, but, uh, the forest that you study might be different. Um, uh, a forester might come up with different values than I did. I was just using stuff I found offline right away. But it did show me that a study is going to be a worthwhile thing to do. It's, you know, you may end up with uh, some PV arrays passing. I suspect you're going to end up with lots of PV arrays passing from my quick study, but you you may find instances where a PV array is not going to make sense for that array and that forest. Uh, ben, well, so in this example, you picked an acre. In, if I'm understanding, yeah, just per acre. I was just doing a per. I, acre. I understand, but if I understand correctly, up to two acres, there's essentially no none of this kind of yeah. study level right. review. Right. Is it also true that the old board feet based threshold is not used? Right, it disappears. It disappears. So this replaces that. So what I worry about is that this creates an incentive. Oh, or when you're doing board feet, you might find a very well developed, mature stand of trees. And you can get a lot of board feet out of these large trees. Whereas you can get far fewer board feet out of uh, new, you know, a younger forest or a less developed forest, and so it might change. It just it, just by using an acres versus a board feet incentive, it'll change which which forests you're more likely to cut down. You can make an argument in both directions, right? The younger forest 
because it has more growing to do, it's, it's an earlier part of its growth cycle, it actually has more carbon sequestration capacity than this mature oak forest that's later in its growth, growth cycle. But you could also say that this mature forest has a well-developed ecosystem and is providing all these other benefits. So I guess I just, I just worry about kind of the, this, the perverse selection <coughs> involved when, when you go to just a simple acreage. I realize you've got to come up with a cutoff, but is there a way of having two thresholds? Or well, there's, like a, there's other variables, of course, uh, depending on the wood stock, right? If, if it's uh, repurposed lumber, that still is sequestering carbon. Yeah, absolutely. Um, if it's slag, and they, or they just cut it and burn it, that's exhausting the carbon. Um, the, there's, and you're right, we have to find a usable threshold, and part of, part of the pressures, of course, Lily alluded to, is the state has incentivized not de-incentivized, and this is what us trying to put a governor on top of an engine that's allowed to run wide open. Yeah, exactly. And so this is the struggle that we've been having, and um, and I have to say I'm I'm pleased with the reconciliation. I mean I think it's it's not ideal because we we are comparing apples and screwdrivers in some cases, which you know they but we're trying to find a happy medium in order to make this work at least and, and I, I, I think the two acre the two acre limit and cap also somewhat discourages some of the concerns that Lily is talking about as large scale harvesting and, and large scale uh, companies coming in and, and, and just taking advantage of cheap uh, cheap land and cheap opportunity without without a buyer leave. And, just a, and a community that's got not, that has no resources in which to resist. So. One other comment is a significant tree ordinance still right. applies applies to anything under two acres, right. correct? Yeah. Okay. And um, and we are the tree commission is in the um, midst of reevaluating the significant tree ordinance and adding a little bit more teeth to that, mm -hmm. so that if there really are some huge trees, it's going to be very expensive. For them to remove, to remove. It's true. We modified the language that originally went from started off as identifying old trees and changed it uh, at the recommendation of the tree committee to the, essentially the size of the tree as opposed to its age. Um, and, just, yeah, and just one more point on the DBH versus the acreage. When we had the DBH cap, it was very hard for people who uh, there aren't a lot of people in forestry who understand how to calculate that. So lots of people would be asking, well, what does that mean? Can I do it on my property? I don't know what kind of tree, you know, I'm not a forester either. So it's really so site dependent to deter because of what you said. So um, the another um, objective that we were trying to achieve is making it simplified so that anybody can pick up the ordinance and understand. I mean, not everybody can look and say, okay, that's one acre and that's two acres, but at least they can create some way of measuring what that's going to mean on their property. Is there a reason why the board footage rule is being eliminated as, as opposed to doing both at the same time? Um, well, so uh, we wanted to make, uh, initially the, um, language was created to, um, and the threshold for board feet was created because it was um, a measure that the state uses for forest cutting plans. So we, it wasn't anything more magical than that. Um, but I think it's just, it would create, I think, undue complications by creating um, or having two sets of standards or two different ways of measuring a threshold. So, um, we really want to make it so that anybody can understand what the, the ordinance is. It's a, also to culturally, the, the language is originally developed in the context of harvesting foresters and not right. relative to how we, it was actually to promote in some way uh, a, a, a sellable product right. in, the, in the lumber area. So as opposed to, they weren't considering carbon sequestration, that wasn't an issue. 
Um, now that's obviously an issue. So identifying by board feet is, is, is reinforcing or playing into that same mindset and the, the idea is to move away from that, those criteria and be more plain spoken about it. I, don't know, I guess I have a comment. There's this feeling of like in 30 or 50 years from now, you know, we want to have a zero carbon grid. And we need, we need our infrastructure to change from fossil fuels to renewables. And large scale solar is a major part of that. And like, you know, we're talking about zero energy codes. And then, you know, thinking about what the future is going to be. And I can just imagine like all these towns around us have these huge PV arrays that are, you know, benefiting big companies going into a new kind of grid. Um, and we're benefiting from that. You know, yet our forests are pristine, which is fantastic, not pristine, but less impacted. Which is great, but it also kind of feels a little bit like NIMBYism. Yeah, I'm just fast forward. Like, how are, how are we expecting to make this huge transition? Like, should it just be all rooftops? Like, is that a fair enough like assumption place we need to say the companies need to go there? Or like, you know, what, what, where are these going to be if not in communities, if not in, in lands like ours? I'd like to say, my reading of the ordinance and the fact that it's based on actually doing a carbon study. Um, with this, and then taking into account places where the forests really are um, required, you know, corridors of some kind. Um, you know, there's things where you really shouldn't do any kind of development. Doesn't matter what it is. You should, should it, those should be off limits because of other reasons. If you are based on carbon study, and it, it may not be perfect, but at least it's a try. I, I, I don't then, really buy the carbon study. I, I meant to include this in what my statement is partly because like we don't know what the technology is going to be in ten years. Like no, PV densities are going to be right. so different potentially in ten years. Like it may be a hundred, no, ten times more efficient. Like then one they come back. Then they come back later on with a more efficient array. Right, but to do carbon studies now, based on the lifespan of those trees, you know, a tree is a very no, 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 set it's, system. You do it. Am I thinking about it wrong? Yeah, well, the carbon study will be on based on a ten-year period, as I recall. Mm -hmm. Right, and so it's basically if you put this array in. Oh, over what you have years. right now, okay. then you put it in mm -hmm. over 10 years. Is that is that PV array going to increase carbon in our atmosphere, or is it going to decrease carbon in our atmosphere? And if it's going to increase carbon in our atmosphere, then you don't get put it in. And if it's going to decrease carbon in the atmosphere, you get to put it in. I actually think most PV arrays are going to make it. I think that's true. From, from well, why why not make it 20 year? Or, yeah. Well, that's just. The, the life of a tree, an average tree stand or something. Well, it's also, so that, as you point out, the technology changes and probably the system, the solar systems that would probably be uh, retrofitted as they go right. further down. Right, the ground mounts are in there. Right. And then the criteria remains the same, so their projections are even better, more improved. They can do a greater density in, in the area that they have with, with hope, presumably and hopefully, uh, better capacity. Yeah, those changes are coming. I mean, it's, it's yeah. Oh no, I, I mean, yeah. that's that was sort of built into this discussion. Mm -hmm. That yeah. and the and the hope was that um, yes, as they improve and their efficiency improves, improves and their ability to uh, occupy a smaller footprint or at least expand their capacity within the footprint that they've already applied for. So it doesn't seem that they're the likelihood of them expanding would it would be more likely they would just concentrate and become more dense as opposed to expanding and trying to take down more trees. So I think, you know, based on the the, the projected possible lifespan of a, of a solar system, uh, would probably be the better criteria to analyze. Five years, 20 years, uh, you know, if you want to project out what the, I, I think based on Chris's analysis um, and his, his very conservative analysis, I think that this is a pretty low bar to jump over for most developers as far as it goes. I mean, as far as meeting the, meeting the projections on, on carbon sequestration and offsets. I mean, I mean, that's what I actually worry about is I've done these sorts of studies too with, okay, you cut down some trees. In an almost every case, you uh, prevent carbon emissions equivalent to what, what the trees were, what you released by cutting down the trees very rapidly. This is assuming that they um, they are combusted. Right. Right. Exactly. So yes. like this is this is again worst yeah. worst, worst case, case scenario. 
And that just speaks to that just speaks to how dirty the grid is still, right? Yeah. And, and that's what, what you're competing against. And so I guess what I'm worried about is in fact this is a terribly low bar. And so it, what you want to do is preserve ecological function. Yeah. And you need to look at ecological function and what is where is it and what is it that we want to protect. And I again I don't know that an acreage limit, you know, realize two acres is not that big, so that that's a reasonable limit, but it might make sense to kind of what is it we're actually trying to protect as, as a function? I don't think carbon sequestration. Well, is here's the beauty of law, and I know Lily wants to talk, but there's the beauty of law. No, is you have other agenda. I do need to move on. Okay, to it's it's yeah. actually not carbon, so it's a, it's a you can adapt based on as as evidence presents itself. Part of the thing is there's an urgency to this because right now it's it's a free for all. You can I mean basically you can wise ass this and clear it out before you even present plans for development. So we want to we want to protect what we've got without 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 having rules. Chris's very conservative analysis also didn't take into consideration the sequestration that's contained in the stumps, which is also significant. Is about about a third to a half of the, the tree's capacity for carbon sequestration stump and root systems. When preserving those, that's actually even even more so. But I think, given where we started, and given where everyone was struggling with, um, the, the it seems that we have a workable. And as Lily pointed out, one of the few criteria on which we can limit and at least provide get data sense on some level where other communities just don't have those have that opportunity and I think that uh, that may discourage some developers to say well this is just too much of a pain and they'll go on but other ones local probably more local systems would be would understand what's the you know the ethos behind it. one, one more okay. Okay. Last Thank word. You. okay. <laughs> um, I think this is a great compromise bill uh, ordinance. I, I, um, I think that what makes me so excited about it is the habitat evaluative piece. Um, uh, like Aiden, I'm actually uncomfortable with the reductionism of the carbon analysis. I feel like it leaves out an enormous amount of understanding and appreciation for the other functions that forests and trees perform. Huge. I mean, we're, worldwide we have a 78% collapse of our flying insect population. You know, we are, our, our ecologic systems are collapsing. We need to preserve the ones we have. Um, we are part of a fragmented, yes, but it is a contiguous forest system that goes from northern New Jersey to, to Canada. And we need to preserve that because it is to our hubris to cut those down for these technologies um, that provide a very narrow function compared to the multifarious functions that a forest provides. Stormwater management. We're, gonna, we're living in a region now that's going to face much greater precipitation. It already is fa facing 75% greater precipitation events in, in the last you know, 30 years or so. And that's going to intensify. We need those systems to be working for us in ways that we cannot easily calculate by a back of the envelope calculation. So, um, you know, I think that this, the way it overlays the Nature Conservancy um, data about the value of these corridors, I think is, is, is groundbreaking. It's something I'm gonna share with other communities, encourage them to do the same. Um, so I think that, I feel like Carol and I worked very hard together to, to reach some compromised language and I'm very satisfied with where it is. All this is very encouraging here, thank you. Appreciate the time. On that, yes, thank you. I'm going to move on Those to the next excellent uh, thing. Thank you. Yeah. Are we, we're not voting to support it? Or to no. no. No, all this was, on, the only reason it was on the agenda was so that I would have an opportunity to provide whatever feedback I had gathered. Uh, to yeah, we were. I mean, it wasn't really even. Counselors were whining, basically. Yeah. <laughs> was just trying not to say. Counselors I was trying not to say that word, but so, so, so yeah. what helped for us to vote and say? Um so uh, uh, actually three more things on the agenda. Um, 
Um, and because the climate resilience regeneration, I think it's going to take a little bit of time, right, Wayne? Okay, I want to get over the other two just real quickly. Uh, I take a motion to approve the minutes of uh, so April move. 11. Yep, we have a second. Uh, uh, minutes of 4-11-18. I'm uh, sorry, 4-11-19. Ooh, ooh, that okay. error on the agenda. Um, Scribner's there. Right. Scribner's okay. there, good yeah. enough, okay. Uh, any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Yeah. Hold it up. No, no objection? <laughs> what was that? Uh, request for bueno order. Drew my hand. <laughs> <laughs> there's, uh, there's brownies, and there's chocolate chip cookies, and there's... Okay. Don't tell Dave, though. Okay, since we have the net zero stretch energy code on on here, and it was really basically just to kind of to bring up and discuss the BBRS effort, which has kind of happened already because of the Dell's report. The only thing I'll add to it is I have a letter here from the mayor to the dear chair, uh, co-chair and board members, this letter to the BBRS, very strongly pushing for a net zero stretch energy code. Great. That's going out uh, tomorrow. So if anybody wants to read it, it's there. Um, uh, but other than that, um, and other than, um, unless the commission wants to speak a little bit about, you know, how do we try to, because quite frankly, getting the BBRS to move is going to be difficult. Getting the legislature to push BBRS might actually be an easier path, um, I hate to say. Um, uh, and at the moment, both um, our senator, Joe Comerford, and our, our rep, Sabadosa, are both in support of the bill to uh, have a stretch that, you know, so there's not, not a lot we have, you know, not a lot of power but we have, because everybody's already going that direction. Um, unless the, the commission wants to talk about this to find some other ways, I would move on to um, talking about the resilience and regeneration plan, so. Adele, you were asking, what, um, well, based on your characterization, mm -hmm. doesn't sound like it's a particularly receptive group that would be, would care what, what this committee said when we I think the more they hear from municipalities, the better, so that they officially have a record that municipalities are asking them to do this. And I think that sending copies of the letter to the governor and uh, everybody else in between is a very good idea so that there's awareness. That and you were asking for a resolution to support the... The legislation. The, yeah, the legislation, the, maybe a letter from the mayor that we could, that, that Chris could pass on to the mayor, that the, having the mayor right representing the community. Well, the mayor's written to BBRS. Oh, that's right, you just said that. Yeah, the mayor's written to BBRS yeah. and, and copying all the yeah. so So there's that, and um, you and I and Lisa should talk about drafting a resolution. Yeah, our city council. Okay. Yeah. What about other town, getting other towns involved? Is that our role at all, or have you talked to other? Point people. I'm not sure if that would be the commission's role. Certainly could be anybody else who's out there. You know, your personal role um, could not hurt, I would think. I mean, am I right? It's the Energy Commission. It seems like the Energy Commission's Northampton's commission. It's, yeah. But we don't. Well, you should just tell your other peers. I, yeah. yeah, totally. And by the way, my, the, my other peers want a copy of uh, that um, uh, uh, large ground mount PV or regular. <laughs> <Right. Yeah. laughs> um, I guess I'm kind of tempting to kind of close off conversation on this so we can get to resilience and regeneration, but am I closing it off prematurely? Okay, let's go on. Uh, Wayne, it's all yours. I'm in resilience and regeneration. So this is somewhere between a two-minute conversation and the 24 minutes we have left, depending on what people want to talk about. So just very quickly, so I just sent out yesterday to you and all notice the draft plan without you know, without lots of attachments and exhibits. And so the main thing today is sort of give, if people have had a chance to read it and want to give feedback, that would be great. Just so you know the process going forward. So I go through and compile all the comments I've received from other people, because the planning board tonight is a similar process, though I'm not sure how many comments we get. I send it to the consultants. They then take this and make a much fancier, what looks like the final plan, and then we're holding public forums on it. So at that point, we do more significant outreach, you're all welcome to make comments. Then it's easier to edit a document in Word than it is a document in, in design. So I'm trying to get as much comments up front, but don't feel like you've, you've lost your chance to do it. Um, so, uh, you know, you all know, as we talked about this before, the main charge of the plan is 
if we want to be carbon neutral by 2050, you know, what's the clear roadmap to get there? And so they're trying to do that. And then on the resiliency side, what are all the different steps that are, that are, that are important? Um, there's tables in the middle of this, which have not actually changed significantly from like, the last time I was here. Um, and the rest is sort of text and build and all. So that's sort of my spiel. Has anyone had a chance to look and have comments? I have. Oh, anybody else? I, can, I can't get it to download, so I'm just, yeah. Oh, I will read it tonight. Okay. What's that? Yes, this, this is the one. Okay, okay. I don't think I saw it. What do you got, Chris? Kind of So, I mean, really good, strong vision statements throughout, um, I thought. But um, when it got to the, um, at, at the energy strategies that spelled out in the executive summary, I felt that they were really weak. There was a lot, I mean, there was no goals or, it was, I mean, they just felt, it, there wasn't a lot of teeth in them. Um, I don't know if that would change when you get down to, um, you know, the, de the details actually, actually aren't there, I guess, right? Right. Yeah, because the pathways action section seemed to indicate there was a lot more uh, to all these energy strategies. And so that might, uh, that my comment might just disappear when I see the actual, actual more actions and stuff that are underneath there. But just the very top, if you read it, it's, you know, um, advance, work on, that kind of stuff. It's, it's like you, you can put in one more sidewalk and you accomplish the transportation goal. <laughs> um, uh, uh, I was kind of surprised and um, eye-opener to see the greenhouse gas emissions that came out of our, what was called the business sector, these are a larger commercial industrial businesses um, and institutional entities. It's more than half of our carbon emissions. And um, I don't think they were really well represented in the um, input process. So I think a period of time to reach out to some of our largest institutions and commercial establishments um, gather them together and have a conversation with them. On what are they doing? They might actually be doing a lot already. Smith College is definitely doing stuff. Um, I think that might be um, a real worthwhile uh, way to uh, step to add into this. Um, I was really surprised to see solid waste disposal, greenhouse gas <coughs> emissions from solid waste disposal was only 1% of our greenhouse gas emissions. That seems like there's an error there. What? Yeah, that's yeah. the same. It just that seems like that's an error. I, I, I don't know what, you know, it's, it's, there's nothing underneath there. Solid waste disposal has to be higher than 1%. Um, um, but I don't know why. So, Chris, to get the question is why is that? Yeah, why, why, why is that unreasonable? Well, why is 1% unreasonable? Yeah. All of the materials that we buy, the packaging, uh, I mean, it's, it's enormous. Oh, you're talking about life cycles. You're talking about the embodied energy before we've disposed of it. Well, where does the, where, I mean, is, it, is the emissions you're talking about just like the truck emissions to move the stuff? Or is it the emissions that are involved in the stuff? Because I mean, the emissions in the life stuff, cycle, if you're talking about components. life cycle, say carbon emissions of materials, sure, that's, that's a very different analysis I mean, I would imagine that this is referring to emissions involved with transporting waste and then methane generated uh, in landfills. Right. That's going to be pretty small relative to all these other emissions. Really? Yeah. Methane generating mass, it, 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 that, that's, that, that is small compared to the rest. Relative to all these other. <laughs> but we don't have a landfill. So we're, right. Well, we do. Well, we're responsible for it. We have a going with meth else's and landfill. It is or discharging or methane. And we transport all our garbage. And it depends where we transport it to and right. that process is. So it, right. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I'm wrong. I, I just I, thought that waste was a lot larger percentage. I, I presented a webinar recently at USDN, sort of how we put together this plan with one of the person who did it. And what all the sustainability directors on the call were grappling with is we believe in community participation, right? It's a big part of what we do. But when we compare greenhouse gas emissions from sort of potential high impact projects or versus what the public wants. There's a disconnect. And one place that came up is everybody wants to deal with recycling and isn't that great and we can feel good. But the number that everybody else has okay. between one and three percent of their communities. 
So we're sort of we're moving a low end of what Eric consistently wanted to do. Oh, okay. I learned something here. That, that's, um, I was picturing it. I mean, maybe that was because when I did a greenhouse gas emission uh, from the city's perspective, yeah, this is probably what influenced me. I then got emissions from the landfill, and it completely dwarfed municipal greenhouse gas emissions. It was it was a, it was just. Greenhouse, you know, municipal greenhouse gas emissions were minuscule compared to the emissions coming off the landfill. But that makes sense because the municipality is a tiny little entity, whereas the landfill is, you know, take, taking its emissions created by Northampton and even maybe some surrounding communities. Oh, yes. Yeah. Right. <laughs> right. So, so you know, it was, it was, it was a, maybe that's what got that in my mind. Um, so I was surprised to see that here. But okay, I'll, I'll take that. Have you guys looked at uh, capturing the methane and burning oh, yeah. it for yeah, power? Yeah. Yeah. We were doing that. Yeah, yeah, right. yeah cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, okay, so um, then when you get down to the um, the pathways section, I was I couldn't find energy efficiency in there, and it might be. Under um, uh, what do you call it? You had the um, energy disclosure um, as one of the pathways, which strikes me as energy disclosure is a um, is a strategy or a, you know an action under energy efficiency. Yeah. But energy efficiency, I would think, would be the first and biggest in there, and I didn't see it in there. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. Um, okay. That's about it. The only last little one is when you talked about um, heat pumps. Um, the city has more heat pumps in that we mentioned if you wanted more examples just to kind of beef up, you know, how normal this is getting. Um, um, you know, senior centers got geothermal and that stuff. Okay, okay. There's a few others like that. So. Okay, thanks. So you could add a few others. That was so that's okay. what I got with a quick review. Okay. Yeah. So I'd love comments by tomorrow if people can do them so I can do this first phase, but I'll take comments as soon as, as soon as you can because again we can we still have another crack okay. So the next step when we get the final report, then we need to figure out a process. Be another, you know, both come before you guys and planning board and we'll do a public forum. Great. Okay. Right. That's all I got. Alrighty, hey, I get this out early. <laughs> I'll take a motion to adjourn. So move so Dave can leave. <laughs> I'm not making...